Hey guys, uh, so we got to stages of moral development in first period. We kind of moved a little faster on uh, Thursday uh, before school let out. But in third period, we were slowing down and we were talking, and so we didn't get to moral development. So um, first period, you can skip this first part of the video uh, unless you want just a refresh. Uh, while third period, you stay with me here. Um, and, and let's talk about moral development. So um, you might be familiar with the trolley prop. Wait, where, where am I? The trolley problem uh, that is a very famous moral dilemma, uh, and how you answer moral dilemmas is, is is reflective of what stage of moral development you are in, uh, based off of the research of Lawrence Kohlberg, who came up with the different stages of moral development. So just a quick recap of what this trolley uh, dilemma is. So this is you. Um, let me get a little pen here. This is you. You are just a bystander and you see that there is a trolley that has the driver of the trolley has is incapacitated, passed out. Um, and if the trolley continues on its current path, there are five people on the tracks that are going to die if you do nothing. Um, but you are standing next to this lever and if you pull the lever, then you can divert the trolley onto the separate tracks, but that will kill one person and that's there. So by doing nothing, you're letting five people die or do you actively kill one? Like, do you make the decision to then kill this person right here? Um, there are many different versions of this trolley example. It's like where now there's one person you know, or maybe this one person is pregnant. There's also another example of where like you are, there's no lever, but instead of like you're on a bridge and there's a really big fat guy who's on the bridge. Um, this is the fat guy. I don't know what I'm doing here. Uh, and, and you uh, have the ability to push him off of the bridge where he falls onto the tracks and his body is so big that he uh, stops the train. It's definitely going to kill him, but it does save these five people. So that kind of puts you more of an active role. So, you know, what do you do? So uh, according to, uh, let me, there we go. According to Lawrence Kohlberg, uh, he came up with three stages of moral development. And there's no particular ages uh, that go along with these stages. You know, you could be um, making moral decisions based off of, like, in any in any stage uh, of, like, any of these. It, it, can, it can go along with any age is what I'm saying. Uh, so pre-conventional morality, where you make moral decisions based off of either wanting to avoid punishment or like you're wanting to get a reward. So people say like, well, I don't do that because I don't want to go to jail or I don't, I, I'm going to do that because then I'll get like a reward. I'll get like, you know, a praise. And so, um, it's, it's mostly indicative of younger kids. This is the earliest stage of moral development. It's like, you know, why, but if you're like, I don't kill people cause I don't want to go to jail. That's probably not the highest level of morality in terms of why you shouldn't kill people. It's not like, well, I don't want to go to jail. Uh, that's, I mean, maybe there's more to it than that. Um, so maybe, uh, people in the pre-conventional stage might not pull the lever cause they don't want to get in trouble. They don't want to get in trouble for killing somebody. And so it's like, well, I'm not going to get involved because, um, I don't want to get in trouble for touching things that aren't mine, like the lever, or, um, I could go to jail for killing somebody and I'm just not going to do it. While conventional morality is, um, they follow rules. Not because they don't want to get in trouble, because rules are rules and rules are meant to be followed. And so they don't necessarily question the rules. It isn't about the consequences per se, just like um, I am in dress code because that's just what the rules are. Or I don't speed because there's a speed limit sign and I follow the speed. And so it's not necessarily trouble, just I follow the rules because rules are rules. So um, they might not pull the lever because they're like, uh, the rules are not to get involved or, and the rule is, you know, killing is illegal. Not that they don't want to go to jail. Not going to jail is the very pre-conventional morality, but saying that I don't want to kill somebody because killing is illegal is conventional morality. That's just the law. That's what you do and not do. 
while post-conventional is this higher field of morality, this higher, higher level where there is some like universal truths, some universal law that um, you recognize. And that's why, like, I don't murder people because I do not have the right to take someone's life. Everyone has the right to live. And I do not have the ability to take away someone's right to live. And, uh, and you know, that would be a reason, a, a post-conventional morality way to, to justify your actions. You know, uh, they might say you don't steal because people have the right to property and I do not have that right to property. And, and, uh, someone in post-conventional would probably end up pulling the lever because even though it's killing one, you are potentially saving, you're saving five. And, you know, it's, 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 it's simple math. Uh, five lives is greater than one life. And so if you have the ability to save five, um, that's what you do. And so uh, if you want to go into Schoology and to find this uh, like page on, in uh, our slides, so you can actually watch these uh, little clips from The Good Place where they actually reenact the trolley example um, and a couple different variations of the trolley example. I love that show. So it's a, it's, it's a good video clip if you want to go check it out on YouTube. Um, so when Col uh, Kohlberg came up with this, uh, he used the trolley example, but he also used, uh, used another um a uh, moral dilemma called the Heinz dilemma. So that's basically uh, your spouse is dying of some rare form of cancer and there is a drug that will save her. Um, and the, the druggist who's in town, um, he has the drug. Uh, he It costs him $500 to make it, but he sells it for $5,000. You go to him and you're like, I don't have $5,000. And he's like, sorry, I can't sell you the drug. And you're like, well, what if I give you payments and eventually I'll, I'll pay you the money. I just, I need the drug now. I said, sorry, that's not how I do business. I'll run out of, you know, I, it's, I came up with the drug. I should be able to charge whatever I want. And so do you steal the drug to save your spouse? Um, a pre-conventional would say no, cause I don't want to get in trouble for stealing. Conventional morality would say no, because you, um, stealing is illegal. And post-conventional morality would say, well, while people have the right to property and people have the right to life, the right to life is greater than the right of property. So you should steal the drug in order to save uh, your spouse. So the problems with these, uh, these, these stages of moral development is that when Kohlberg created these stages, he was only studying the responses of males and not just any male, like, it's a very narrow. He only studied rich, white, American males when he made these studies. And so he was not um, t like women could very well answer these questions a whole lot differently um, and and uh, and make moral decisions differently than men. But these stages are based on the responses of men. So women might uh, just might have. Uh, a different perspective on how they would tackle these moral dilemmas. Okay, so um, well, well, let me erase my eraser, erase my trolley example, because now we're talking about Freud's stages of psychosexual development. So in class, we worked on this table. We had Piaget up here. We had Erickson on the back. Now we're going to finish this out with Freud's stages of sexual development. And you see the stages right here in order, oral, anal, phallic, latency, and genital. Um, and so there's approximate age, give or take, and then what's going on in the stage. So keep in mind, this is all about, uh, let me get rid of uh, this. Can I go back? No. Okay. So, uh, this is all about pleasure zones in a person's body and like their focus on pleasure. And they either are going to like receive the appropriate pleasure from this uh, erogenous zone um, or they are going to get fixated on some, like they did not conquer it this stage well. And so they're going to have this fixation later in life because they didn't conquer this stage. So the first stage is the oral stage. And this is a baby. This is an infant. So they're getting most of their pleasure from their mouth because of feeding. This is, you know, breastfeeding. They're getting like all of their joy is coming from eating. Uh, and so you either 
are going to be breastfed correctly by your mother, according to Freud, um, you know, for the appropriate length of time. Or maybe you had a hard time latching on, or maybe she didn't breastfeed you because you were on bottle or something. And maybe you don't conquer this stage, according to Freud. Keep in mind that most of this stuff is not really science. It's not, it's not something that we like put too much weight in today. Uh, so while I'm saying this, don't like take this to heart. This is, we study it because it's, it's relevant to, we say, say these things, like we use this terminology in, in culture today. Um, so we need to know like where it came from and Freud's research did influence a lot of other people who are much more relevant, like Eric Erickson, for example. Um, but this does not necessarily mean that what I'm saying is accurate. <laughs> okay. So the oral stage. If you become fixated on the oral stage, like something goes wrong with this breastfeeding pleasure uh, receiving time in your life, uh, then you're going to have an oral fixation. You're going to be like a nail biter, maybe like a like a pen capture. You're constantly um, putting things in your mouth in order to receive pleasure from them. You might smoke. They even say that sarcasm, being like a sarcastic person, is like a, a quick tongue. Uh, you know, like quick wit at the mouth, you're receiving pleasure from like the things that you're saying uh, is an example of having an oral fixation, that something went wrong in this stage in your life. Then we have potty training. So we have uh, the anal stage. So this is all about the pleasure you get from being correctly potty trained, being able to hold your bowels in and like having... Um, uh, control over your own body functions and how that re you receive pleasure of like, yeah, I did it. I'm not making a mess of myself. And so uh, if for whatever reason you have a problem in this area, according to Freud, you are going to basically have all the symptoms of like OCD. Um, you know, you're going to be orderly and you're going to have and your anxiety and you're going to be obsessive and you're going to be really clean and rigid and you're going to follow like order because you had such like a mess as a baby because you weren't potty trained all that well or you had a hard time with it and because of that you're going to learn to be like you're going to go over over clean and be very rigid and very like uh focused and you know uh anxious and just they actually if you talk to anybody who's older um and you ask them um like before we use the term OCD, what did people call people that were like neat and tidy? They, a lot of people in the nineties and before would call them anal retentive, which is directly from this stage, like in the anal stage, anal retentive, you are retaining your anuses by being so clean and orderly and neat and washing your hands a lot and having lists and things like that. Okay. So next stage is the phallic stage. Uh, this is from a three to six years old. This is where boys realize that they have penises and girls realize that they do not. So this is going to be um, the like, oh, looking down and seeing like what's going on down there. And so uh, Freud says that this is the um, stage where girls are going to develop penis envy that they feel they are lacking. And at this stage is when you actually see some, um, uh, some deficits or some, I wonder what I'm trying to say. Like, it's almost like boys and girls on a level playing field in terms of like school and, um, personality and things like that. And as soon as girls realize like, oh, I'm lacking a penis. I won't, I feel like I'm missing something. I'm lacking something. They like step down and maybe do not excel as high as a man because they're always, they feel less than. And so, um, you know, that you would, they're not going to be performing as well in school. They're not going to be as loud. They're not going to be, um, they're going to be more timid and mild because they are lacking a penis, says Freud. Okay. And then we've got six to puberty. This is where everything kind of, all of your sexual 
urges all of these like pleasure zones kind of just go away and um, this is the latency stage this is basically where boys have cooties and girls are gross and girls hang out with other girls and boys hang out with other boys and you don't have like this intermingling of boys and girls they're very like separated like a like an elementary school dance or something and so uh, you this is where you now develop your social skills with people of your same gender and same sex um, and, and you become friends and it's all about friends. And it's not really about pleasure. Um, if you have a problem with this, like you don't develop this, you're going to have this sense of just being immature, like cause you can't create these social relationships with other people. Just like a, you're going to lack a level of maturity that everybody else should be getting in this stage. And the final stage is basically after puberty. Now, you are focusing on members of the opposite sex. Um, for the most part, uh, this is the genital stage. Um, and so this is a, a sexual reawakening. You know, you had pleasure um, from these erogenous zones as a child, and now it's back. And you're looking for sexual pleasure outside of the family. Because keep in mind, Freud would have said that before this, you would have received pleasure from inside the family. This would be, you know, uh, the Oedipus complex of boys secretly in love with their father or uh, secretly in love with their mothers while girls are secretly in love with their fathers. So what could go wrong here? Um, you could just lack basic social norms in terms of like dating and, and, and sexual uh, social norms. So like, you know, people that have like weird um, obsessions or kinks or whatever, that this is them not mastering the genital stage, that they are like, they're into something that's just, that's different from the social norm. Okay. So keep in mind, take this all with a grain of salt. This is Freud. So it's, you know, not super based in science, but there is, you know, we say some of these things nowadays. Okay. Last bit before we are done with development, we got to talk about adulthood because everything we've we've been talking about like development as a child, but there is some um, things that are changing as you're an adult. One of those things being um, a physical decline. <laughs> so your senses get weaker, your eyesight, your smelling, your hearing. You know this. Um, while older people are less likely to get sick from like a cold because they've built up immunity. Um, their whole life. They've, uh, you know, every time you get sick, you get a little bit more resistant to that. Um, so they're more, they're less likely to get a cold, old people, but they're more likely to have dementia, Alzheimer's and like cancer and things like that, the big guys. Um, dementia, Alzheimer's is really a breakdown of the brain. Um, sometimes it can be caused by little tiny strokes or like uh, alcohol use. Um, and when it comes to recall and recognition, recall is just like if, uh, just coming up with an answer without any clues while well, recognition would be think of it as like you can recognize like oh i know that so as you get older your ability to recall past events is more challenging it's like if you run into someone in the store that you know to be able to, to be able to recall their name like out of thin air is like that's harder to do when you're older but they will be able to recognize so recognition of like oh i know them and i recognize where i am and i recognize this place that all stays constant throughout your uh, life but recall is going to go down in later adulthood we're talking about like 70s and on Okay. Uh, when it comes to fertility, women are going to be losing fertility, um, you know, in their mid forties, uh, where, and that's called menopause. Men never lose fertility. They can, um, they can constantly produce sperm throughout their whole life. And so they can father children, uh, until their dying day while women are going to lose their uh, ability to, to conceive a child. Um, when it comes to life expectancy, the average in, in the United States is 78.8 years of age. It's a little longer for a woman. I think it's like one to two years on average for a woman. Um, they live longer than men. And speaking of death, uh, there's a Kubler-Ross stages of dying and grief. Um, so this, you probably have seen this stage before, denial, acceptance, bargaining, depression. Uh, sorry, I, I can't read. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Uh, this is all about uh, when you are told that you are dying, the stages that you go through. And an anxiety about dying is not, it doesn't get 
like more, you don't get more anxious the closer you are to death. You actually get less. It kind of peaks around a, a middle adulthood, but like later adulthood, anxiety about dying lessens. So um, it's not something that people, older people are all that scared of anymore. But, um, you know, when you are given uh, awful news, tragic news, uh, you go through these stages um, for the most part. Sometimes they can be out of order, but it usually um, starts with denial, ends with acceptance. So you refuse to believe it. Uh, nope, that's the wrong diagnosis. You misread the chart. You probably got me mixed up with someone else. Anger, anger at uh, the doctor, anger at the medical system, anger at God, anger at yourself. Um, bargaining, like I will do anything. I'll, I'll start praying again. I am going, I would, I'll never smoke a day in my life. I promise I, I'll quit right now. Uh, depression, obviously we know what that looks like. Um, crying, uh, um, loss of appetite, uh, apathy, and then, and then finally acceptance of like, okay, this is reality. Um, and, and moving on. Uh, so that is the end of our development unit. Um, you'll be able to take some, uh, answer some questions after the, watching this video. Hopefully you took some good notes. And remember, we have a mega quiz over all of development when you get back from spring break. If you have not taken notes over um, anything in this unit, go back into the different slides, uh, grab those notes while you can, watch any videos, um, and I'll see you guys later. Have a great break. Bye.